thoughts and reaction to news of a British death and a British national missing in Ukraine? Well, Colin, it won't surprise you to hear, as somebody who's lost several friends on operations, that this is not something that anybody ever wanted to hear. And I, I must say, my heart goes out to the families who are getting this awful news right now. And I just hope that the person who's missing is found very soon uh, and safe and well. Which, as our foreign secretary indicates, or she suggests, could go on for a decade. Uh, are we looking at a conflict that we can liken, say, to something like the Spanish Civil War, where uh, nationals from many different countries, but yes, from the UK as well, will regularly go to fight and, yes, perish? Well, I hope what we're looking at, actually, is a conflict that's going to be uh, resolved soon. You know, we're increasing massively the armaments available to the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainians have mobilized themselves extremely effectively uh, into a very formidable armed force. And they're demonstrating their capability in taking on what can only be described as the corrupt remnants uh, of a once great army, uh, which is the Russian army. Uh, they've completely torn it to pieces in, in the north and the northeast, and now uh, they've pinned it down in the, in the southeast. I hope very much what we'll see is that our support, the support of many, many other countries around the world in you know, uh, new forms of or different forms of weaponry and increasing amounts of ammunition uh, will mean that this war is ended soon with the Russians driven out of uh, Ukrainian territory. Is it a realistic war aim, a realistic war aim to expect Russia to be completely ejected from Ukraine? Well, I think a realistic war aim, I'm afraid, is, is to leave this to the Ukrainian people to decide, because it's they who are uh, fighting and dying for their country. It's they who are going to have to make the decision as to what is and what is not acceptable. It's, I'm afraid it's not for me to make that call. What I think we should be doing is making sure that we support them in every way that is necessary. We make sure that they have the capability to take the actions they feel they wish to take. And then it's up to them to evaluate what the costs of those actions are. It's not up to me to do that. It does feel, though, however, this week of all weeks, that our involvement, the UK's involvement in this conflict is new in terms of the level of engagement. I say that within an hour of us learning that a British national has been killed in Ukraine, one missing two. But also in the week that we heard Sergei Lavrov talk about the, uh, and not just Sergei Lavrov, also the foreign ministry spokeswoman, say in terms we've not heard before that the UK, NATO, but specifically the UK was mentioned, run the risk of being targeted as a NATO power involving itself in Ukraine by supplying weapons as a legitimate target for the Russians. Well, that would be a, a remarkable change uh, for the Russian military doctrine. After all, they ran uh, proxy wars throughout the 60s and 70s, where they fueled conflict with weapons and indeed training teams and people like that for years and years. And it was uh, if you accept the comparison, that was part of the, the Cold War doctrine. And we're doing uh, less than that in many ways. We, we don't have training teams in Ukraine. What we're doing instead is we're just making sure the Ukrainians have the ability to defend themselves. This is actually an entirely defensive operation. I think it would be exceptionally unwise of um, Putin's Russia to do that. I think it would be exceptionally unwise of Putin to try and escalate this. Uh, he's already fighting on far more fronts than he possibly can manage. Uh, and so I hope what we'll see actually is increasing sense of reality in Moscow, though I must admit, I doubt whether it'll reach quite as far as Putin. And seeing the, uh, the Russians realize the true price of this tyrannical regime that has sadly murdered so many Russian uh, young men in Ukraine. I hesitate to introduce this topic in light of what we've just been talking about and those, or that fatality and a British national missing and everything else that's going on in Ukraine. But we spent a lot of time yesterday on the show talking about this alleged Tory MP uh, seen by two female MPs uh, looking at his smartphone in the, in the House of Commons chamber uh, looking at pornography. Um, we had a very mixed mailbag about it, some people stressing the absolute nutter necessity of process and all this if somebody's career is about to be brought to a shuddering halt, but also many other people saying in any other walk of life, in any other workplace, this sort of behaviour would be absolutely intolerable. What say you? Well, look, I think both of those views are entirely compatible. I think it's completely unacceptable. Nobody in any other workplace would think that was acceptable. There's uh, literally nobody... I can think of who would even vaguely think it was acceptable in any uh, workplace. 
But you're right, it does need to be investigated. I hope that's exactly what the whips are doing. I hope they're doing it very quickly and that they'll resolve this fast, because this isn't just about an individual. This is about getting proper democratic representation into our country. We need everybody to feel that they have a place in our parliament. We need everybody to feel that they have a chance to run, a chance to serve their communities, speak up for the for the voices that they think matter. Now, you know, you and I may agree or disagree with them, but the whole point of a democracy is that people are able to stand and feel able to put forward their point of view and champion it. And they're not, they don't feel that they have to stay away because they're bullied out or shamed out. And so what we need to see is we need to see everybody comfortable in our parliament. And I'm afraid these actions, if they're shown to be true, are going to be absolutely incompatible with a truly functioning democracy. Um, I'm not going to sort of aim for a bit of TV theatrics by saying, do you know who he is? Uh, I mean, you, if you do, you're very welcome to share. <laughs> you don't, OK. Do, do you I think, you know, OK, do you, given what we just said about process, um, it was put to me yesterday that the individual concerned ought to retain their anonymity throughout the course of that process. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, I think that what we've got to do is find out exactly what's going on. The problem with that is part of the process has got to be uh, the suspension of the whip, which uh, at that point, uh, I'm afraid, is pretty revealing. So, you know, I think that's a very difficult thing to achieve um, because the difference of being a member of parliament and anything, anybody else is you're representing a community and the community has a right to know who's, who's representing them um, and has a right to know on what basis and, and in what way you can do so. And if uh, your actions are incompatible with uh, a functioning workplace, then I'm afraid there are other people who have rights too. And those other people... Uh, you know, colleagues on the, uh, you know, in, uh, in members of parliament, but also staff, also uh, staff of your office, staff of the House of Commons also have rights. And so you need to make sure that theirs are protected too. Tom Tugendhat, appreciate your time as ever. Thanks very much. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.